So tell what it, tell me tell me again what Taco Bell Church is, and also since you're this this is Derek's first time meeting you, so oh, okay. what's up with that? Yeah, uh, so Taco Bell Church of God, uh, you know, we had our youth ministry at the church, but there was a couple individuals within the high school ministry that really took a, a liking to me, and they asked if I would lead some sort of small group for the high school kids. Um, and I was like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll do that. And uh, decided every Sunday evening to meet at a local Taco Bell. Um, and we met every Sunday evening. And eventually the employees caught on that we were meeting every Sunday evening. And, and one of them just called us the Taco Bell Church of God. Because uh, they always heard us talking about Bible stuff and Jesus stuff. And, uh, you know, kind of kind of stuck. And I, I found it humorous, especially since, you know, we both went to... Uh, Church of God school. They didn't know that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I was just like, huh, uh, irony of life. Uh, right. But, uh, and so did that for several years up until uh, I moved away and got married. Okay. Very cool. Uh, Derek, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I think now, Derek, you have Assemblies of God background, right? You you were never in the Church of God, correct? Oh, no, we were both. Oh, okay. You're, oh, you're one of those. Nice. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my, my, Dad's family, they, um, like my grandparents, when they were kids, started going to a little storefront church in our little town. And it, you know, and it eventually became a, a for a town of like 400 people, it was a big church back in like the 70s, I guess. And that's where and then my mom, like her family, had ties to like, the assemblies of God and kind of starting some of those churches in our, in the bigger town down the road. And so, and then her immediate family, like wasn't involved in church for a long time. Like when she was a kid and her parents got divorced and eventually they went back, started going back to the assemblies. And then sometime in the late seventies, my mom, her mother and her brother, they, they left the assemblies of God church and went to the church of God. And that's where she met my dad and they got married and we went there for a while. And then we went to a different church of God. And then we went back to the assemblies of God church where my mom grew up. Cause it was pretty much the biggest church in town. And so then that's where I was. But when we went to church of our grandparents, it was a church of God's. And then, so, you know, yeah, but you know, my first camp experience was church of God and that was awful. And I never went again. <laughs> and then when I was in high school, I worked at the Assemblies of God campground that was not far from us. So, so yeah, so, you know, I'm aware of the similarities and differences of them because yeah. I still have my still have family very engaged in both worlds. Right. What was that? Did you, did you notice, did you notice like a different culture between the churches? Like, uh, you know, in your experiences, I mean, um, from the church so, of God perspective, there's there's this sense that, you know, assemblies are like us, but they're not like us. Right. There are some differences. Um, a lot of it is what I kind of, I mean, you grow up and you don't realize it. Looking back, I think legalism per, is, is still more pervasive in the church of God than it is in the assemblies of God. The assemblies of God, I feel like we're a little bit more liberal mm-hmm. <laughs> in the church of God within, you know, way far you from can, you can watch therapy. movies and <laughs> right i mean you know my mom was a kid in the church of god they talked about you know if, if jesus came back and you were in a the movie theater you wouldn't go to heaven all right and, right and um and, and all of those things like each congregation was very contextual you know you know going to a small country church versus a big you know you know my grandparents all like it was pretty much a smaller country church and then big church in town you know um was a lot different different people, things like that. But so I think they were different. One thing that I see is that like church of God is still very caught up on like um, competition between congregations, like publishing lists of attendance and giving and, you know, all that data, like on their district um, websites and, you know, very analytical and all that. And assemblies was never that like um, explicit (laughs) with that kind of data. And then just like, um, you know, just that whole lot. Church of God was definitely, it's, you know, it's just, it's more Southern, I guess. The yeah. Assemblies of God is very, you know, it was, had some, it was, had a lot of West Coast sort of, I yeah. think, feel to it in a lot of ways. 
Church of God is deeply Appalachia in its feel. Mm-hmm. It's the culture. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's very regional, you know, like I had someone tell me even like the churches up north <clears throat> that, that we've started, like in Maryland, Virginia, places like that, that nine out of 10 of those churches feel just like a Southern church, you know, and often the pastors there are Southern. They, they move oh. there, you know, so it's kind yeah. of, do you know, um, she's like an evangelist from, I forget where, somewhere in North Carolina, Lenora Powell. I, I, I do. I do not know. Or Leon, I don't know. Well, her son is the minister of my grandparents' church and has been there for a long time. So they're very, they're very Carolina Church of God people have been for a very okay. long time. But cool. cool. It was funny when I was uh, dating Church of God girl once, and uh, we decided to go to one night an Assembly of God church just down the street from where she lived. I mean, not even a mile. And she'd never been to an Assembly of God church in her entire life, even though this one was just a mile down the street and been there forever. And we went in there, and she was really not sure if the Holy Ghost was going to be there. Uh, like, she was shocked that we went there, and she felt something she would identify with as the Spirit of God. And mm. <laughs> yeah, like she was just... like, like she, but she was really like, I don't even know if that's going to happen. Like, <laughs> it's just like, really? Like... <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it, when I was a kid, they always say, you know, they were just, you know, same church, different pew or, you know, different right. sections of heaven about them. But yeah, they are, you know, I, I, I feel like, I guess I think the, the, the AG was a little bit less intense about like, you know, toward other denominations a little bit than the church of God was very much like, well, why would you go there? Like, you know, right. yeah. Like yeah. you're definitely like, it, it, there's much more of a, a cult like feel with the church of God, like and the identity and like, I'm third generation church of God. And what are you? Oh, you're, you're, you're just starting coming in the last five years. Well, guess what? You need to move over and it's, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how it's done and you're going to take notes and yeah. you're not going to ruffle any feathers. Yeah. It's, very, it's a very unwelcoming yeah. denomination. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And that's one of the reasons I thought, like, after Jimmy and I watched the movie, uh, and, and Derek was there the night we watched the movie as well. Um, I've since watched it again. Have you watched it more than once, Derek? No. Uh, okay. Okay. I, I saw you, by the way. Uh, so Derek was in the movie. Oh, you um, saw him? At, you, yeah. So he, yeah, he's in the movie. And um, I saw you on the stage and I saw you in the crowd. I mean, they got a couple of really good shots of you. Like, you're kind I, of yeah. like right there. Uh, there's one, I think, where you're right under the arm of either Jimmy or Tammy Faye. Like, when they're talking on stage, they move their arm up and yeah, they're like right there. Yeah. Yeah. They shot that a few times. And in a few of the takes, they like, you know, I would shook their hand or was touched, you know, as they were like sort of interacting with people, but that didn't make mm-hmm. it. But. Yeah. So that's one reason why I thought it would be a good idea for us to, to talk because all three of us have a background in the Pentecostal church um, of some sort. Um, Jimmy, I think you were mainly Church of God coming up. Is that right? Uh, actually, I've uh, done Church of God, Assembly of God, and okay. Foursquare. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So. All right. Well, you got one on me. I've never done Foursquare. Yeah. Um, I've worshipped at Assemblies of God, uh, Assemblies of God. I don't remember ever preaching at an assembly. Um, my family was Church of God. Now, my uh, my grandmother was Foursquare, but out of England, Elam Foursquare, which is a little bit different. It's similar, um, but it's not the same organization. Mm. Um, so they actually moved to the United States after World War II and um, spent some time here. There wasn't a Pentecostal church in my town, so they prayed that God would plant a Pentecostal church in our town. And then they went back to England for a few years. And when they came back, there was a church of God right down the road from where they lived, uh, literally right down the road, like on the same road um and so that's that's what i that's what i came up in was ordained in the church of god um till a few years ago and uh, but i've worked in baptist churches uh derek is currently at a baptist church um and is working on staff at the church there uh what do you what is it you do there derek we're figuring that out okay Isn't that um, what it, that's what it is all the time, I feel like. Yeah, I'm mostly doing like administration. And, you know, we have one administrator and one administrative assistant. So I'm taking parts of their jobs because theirs have grown. And so. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. They're figuring, out, they're figuring out what to do with me. 
Very cool. Very cool. I've actually been watching you guys services some on Sunday. I don't, I don't watch too much church, but lately I have been watching you guys some. Um, ever since you preached that sermon, I've, I've watched uh, a few more Sundays since then. So yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. I enjoy it. And we have, uh, and you went to Gardner Webb as well. Yeah. Me? Yeah. No. Um, yeah. I, I went to Bright Divinity uh, okay. in Texas, but I went to Assemblies okay. of God undergraduate Rally Forward. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay, cool. It's a very different world. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, cool. All right, well, you guys ready to jump in and start talking about this movie? Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. I thought maybe we would just start with like our real, you know, our quick takes, you know, like just the general feel we got from the movie, our immediate sort of reaction to it. So um, I don't know, Jimmy, you want to start us off? By the way, Jimmy has a podcast and uh, this may be appearing on his podcast. We're going to save the audio and um, maybe coming out there, but Jimmy's table is the name of the podcast. And you can tell us a little bit about that. And uh, yeah. So uh, Jimmy Humphrey, Jimmy's table.com where I have conversations about the intersection of faith, life, and culture. Um, that means a lot of different things in a lot of different weeks. Uh, but uh, uh, lately it's been uh, me processing my uh, pending divorce um, and, you know, the process that I've been going through um, with that and uh, just sharing my journey of faith and, dealing with my emotions and uh, how I'm handling everything, hopefully graciously and not uh, slamming anybody uh, that, you know, can't be there to say anything back. Um, but uh, that's where I'm at. Uh, Jimmy's table.com for those who want to listen. All right. Appreciate it. So what was your take on the movie, man? Uh, my take on the movie is I, I actually really enjoyed it. And I really felt uh, that uh, it ended up, you know, being a little bit of what I thought I already knew, um, especially since I grew up in the Charlotte area um, and actually got to visit PTL when I was a small child, got to go to the little mall that Jim Baker and them were building. Um, and I can still remember to this day how vivid it was and how colorful it was and how warm and happy feeling it was. Um, but uh, I, I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was uh, a great revelation of who Jim and Tammy were. I, I don't think it came as a shock that the movie kind of portrayed them as very campy, uh, but as very sincere, because I think that's how most people have always understood Jim and Tammy Faye. Um, even though there are some elements that, you know, some folks who you know, really have an ax to grind with them and say, oh, they were just charlatans all along and they knew they were charlatans. And I never thought that having grown up in the area. And uh, I don't think the movie buys that idea either. Um, I think it gives us a very honest and complicated view of who they were as people um, and what they got caught up in along the way. And I, I enjoyed the movie. Um, was it a perfect movie? No, a little long, could have been maybe trimmed back at maybe about 20, 30 minutes. Um, but uh, I thought it was a moving film and I highly enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a little long too, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Derek, what, what was your thoughts on the film, man? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, having been an extra in the film, I, I sort of knew sort of some of the scenes that were going to be in it and started following Jessica Chastain and um, kind of got snippets of the process. So I sort of knew generally what to expect. And it, it, I think it lived up to my expectations that it was really going to be a fair and almost redeeming portrayal to really humanize some folks who were just sort of um, uh, may made to be different than what they really were. You know, they're, the personalities I think that had been created since the fall of their ministry really were sort of, um, uh, I can't think of the right word right now. It um, made them larger than life, even, right. even, you know, after their ministry, which they were big personalities, but I think people remember them being bigger than they really were. And, you know, there's the scandals that sort of surrounded them really jaded people's long-term views of them, you know, looking back. So I think, you know, getting underneath of, you know, who they are and really seeing, you know, a little bit of, especially for Tammy, you know, where she came from and what she may have overcome in her personal life and how that informed her person and her personality and the person she portrayed on TV, um, I think was really um, beneficial. Um, and I think, like I said, I think it was redeeming. I think that from things I've read from her children, like they've been you know, not everything's gonna be hundred percent, you know, it's not a historical documentary. So there's a lot of um, liberty taken with uh, artistic interpretation and shortening a storyline, but, you know, they were um, happy with the 
what was done. And I think, you know, when you're getting that reaction, I think it, like I said, I think it was just redeeming for a lot of people and for them and her memory, especially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for me, um, in terms of actually enjoying the film and, and taking it in, I I thought it was a a well-made film. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, it's, a lot of times Christian films, and I know this really isn't a Christian film, um, don't really execute in terms of actually drawing me in and, and making me feel connected to the characters and all that kind of thing. But uh, I really enjoyed it. I actually cried a few times in the movie. Um, as a minister, I, I was in ministry for uh, over 20 years. So there was a lot of things that I was like, mm, I know exactly what that feels like. And um, so there were a few emotional moments to me for me and like Jimmy, a lot of it, I didn't know, you know, like the first half of the movie, I was thinking, I have so much to fact check when I get home. But then <clears throat> the movie kind of fact check itself because they show the clips of these things actually happening. You know, um, one of the things for me that was, and I don't know how I, I missed this. Well, I do know how, because it wouldn't have been talked about in my house. But, you know, the, the one scene where she interviews um, um, the man with AIDS, the, 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 the gay man, the gay pastor. And, you know, in the earlier parts of the film, she sort of indicated that there was some openness to that. But I was thinking, is that for real? Like, really? And then when they did that scene in the movie, I was like, well, they wouldn't have put that in the movie if it wasn't real, you know, because we can find those clips. Um, So I did. I thought it was also a redemptive look. Um, And, you know, I want to talk about the way they're portrayed and the way that um, I think, you know, we've been talking on the Google document about some of the things you want to talk about. That's one of the big ones I, I kind of see coming up, you know, among all of us is just trying to understand what is the real Tammy and Jim and, and what isn't. And, and maybe that's, you can't tell, but one of the words I like to use is caricatures. I feel like they were caricatures of themselves to some degree. Uh, and then you lay on top of that, you know, what the media does with that, you know, and um so today I actually watched the documentary that the movie was based on, which was made in 2000. Uh, and for those who want to watch it, it's on Amazon Prime. It's $4 to rent it if you'd like to watch it. It's on YouTube um, also. Is it? Okay, good, good. All right, so check it out on YouTube. Probably free there. Um, so it's, it's good, and it's very much like the film. It's longer. I mean, well, I don't know if it's longer time-wise, but it definitely goes into more detail about certain parts of the story, particularly the Jerry Falwell parts. So... Um, but all in all, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a very well-made film. Honestly, I felt like Jessica Chastain's performance is Academy worthy. Um, I mean, she nailed it. She pulled it off. And uh, I have a friend who actually sat in for the old teacher scene, uh, Terry Hudson. <clears throat> and Terry was, uh, he works uh, in that industry some, and he was called in to sit for the teacher, you know, but he was still working with the main actors and actresses. And uh, he, he said that Jessica was a, was a method actor. She never broke character while they were filming the, filming the movie. Uh, Derek, you probably have that experience as well. Like you were on set too. So um, what was that like? I mean, is that, that pretty, pretty different? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't you know. I just, you know, everything was expected, but you could tell that, you know, from what I've read and then being around her on, on set that she took this role and this person very seriously. Like, you know, if you read some things and even like Jay Baker has said, she studied Tammy and she bought, you know, basically since the documentary came out, she's been studying Tammy Faye's life because she knew someday I will make this film and I will play her. And I wanted to do her, you know, justice. And um, I think that that comes through. And that was like, so you you don't know how much of it is her as a, you know, there's a lot of it that's her, Jessica as a person. Then there's some of Tammy, like the scene, you know, I was, uh, in the scene with the Jim and Tammy show, they had all these kids there and she like took the time to go around and like speak with all the kids and ask them, how are you feeling? What's this like? You know, and take pictures with them that we weren't supposed to do. Like she oh, wow. did that, you know, and that's very much like looking back now, it's like on that one, it's like, well, yeah, that's something Tammy Faye would have been all about. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care that I'm, you know, famous. Like I'm going to take time for these people, you know, who yeah. are you know, here and helping us do this show. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So what do you guys want to jump in at? Um, I, you know, I don't know where where we want to start at. I I think, I mean, well, I'll say this real quick. I sent sent out a couple of reviews. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at it. And maybe we'll talk about the character first, because it kind of goes into the first theme that uh, came up between all of us. And that is 
you know, what kind of mask were they wearing? What kind of people were they really? What did we think their intention and motives were? So I read one review. Um, it was written by Stuart Deloney, uh, snarkyfaith.com. Um, he's my friend on Facebook as well. Don't know him personally, though. But he didn't like the movie. He felt like the movie was campy and cartoonish and not serious. Um, I almost felt like in his review, he wanted to see them maybe uh, look a little more like criminals than, than what they looked like. Um, and I don't know Stuart, but my first thought when I read that review was, I don't know if he has much experience in Pentecostalism because. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what made it so believable. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Talk about that. Well, I, I mean, I think like, I mean, especially Pentecostal background, especially when it comes to the preachers, especially like in the church of God, where you have the man of God, um, who's this Moses on the mountaintop type figure that dominates the local church. I mean, just absolutely dominates the local church. Everything that happens in the church is about the man of God and what happens in the pulpit on Sunday mornings. And the entire life of the church revolves around that. And there's this, this great theatrical show that just about all of them put on at some point, especially if they're going to be true to the denominational branding, and especially if they're going to, you know, they, they have to learn to talk a certain in cadence. It's not anointed unless you have this kind of constant up and down pitch moving in your delivery style, unless it's very high tempo, unless it's very theatrical. Yeah, there's, um, a, there's a performance to it. Right. And, and yeah. very much of that performance ends up bleeding into their personal lives. Um, and actually, there was one guy we actually went to college with. I, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, but he was a local Church of God pastor here in the Mecklenburg County area. And he talked about how he told me once and I actually went to his church once as a little kid before uh, I actually met him at, at, at Bible college. But um, he actually talked about how he always wore his long sleeve shirt and dress pants, even when he was laying around the house on a Tuesday evening, because he never knew when a member might just knock on the parishioner door uh, and, and say hello. So he always wanted to be in preacher mode yeah. and, and, the, and just to sit there and talk to him and having heard him preach, there was no distinction between the performance he put on in the pulpit and who he was as a person. And it was a very sincere thing, but I think it was also a very affected thing. Like it was something yes. that he learned through seeing other people do it. And he ultimately embodied it in himself. And I think Jim and Tammy Faye were very much of that same cloth, um, very much of that same mold. And, and I think some people see the campiness of Jim and Tammy Faye. It's like, oh, no, nah, no, nah, that's a that's a show. And maybe this is why that individual who's kind of snarky about their um, the performance of the show is just kind of like, no, nah, they needed to be more like mobsters behind screen who, as soon as the camera stopped rolling, they ended up becoming just like normal, angry, cynical people. No, 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 no. That's not how that works in that culture. Um, right. And uh, I, I don't think it ever, I know she was Assemblies of God. I don't know if he was always Assemblies of God as well, but regardless of what particular Pentecostal domination, that's true to form for, for Pentecostalism in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I was, I told you at the movie theater, it's like WWE, right? <laughs> right. It's, um, it's kayfabe, you know, which in wrestling is, you know, you, you, it's, it's the character you play. And when you're that wrestler, you, you live in kayfabe as much as possible. Um, I have a friend who has met Ric Flair several times and mm -hmm. I, I know other people who've met Ric Flair and they say he's, he is Ric Flair. Like at some oh. point in his life, he, he just got in that. He never came out of it. He right. is that character at the airport, at the restaurant, wherever he goes, he is Ric Flair, 100%. And I, I can attest to that. My uh, <laughs> ex, soon to be ex wife uh, used to actually work for him. Okay. Um, and she said he would walk into the gym and he would walk in with a woo uh, <laughs> as he walked in. And she used to have to pick up his sequence jumpsuits at the dry cleaner. And she says he was very much that way. He was always on character. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's this show on uh, uh, show, uh, Stars right now called Heels, which is about wrestling. And the storyline revolves around these two brothers who run a wrestling company. And, and in the storyline, they don't like each other. They're enemies. And so, and they live in a small town in Georgia. So they have to live that way all the time. 
So they don't go to church together. They don't do public family things together in the, in the, in the show, of course. And it causes all kinds of family problems as a result. But that is I me mean, really, I mean, and not, it's mostly Pentecostalism, but it's right. not just Pentecostalism. Um, I watched the documentary today. Have y'all seen the documentary that the movie is based on? Uh, I saw it once upon a time. Okay. The scene where Jerry Falwell goes down the slide at Heritage, the water slide. So there's a scene in it where um, Jer- they, they were filmed Jerry Falwell going down one of the water slides and he's in full suit. <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny because he's like this big Baptist guy just in a suit, just coming down the slide. But I, um, yeah. I think that that points to um, those sort of differences, you know, we'll get to that sort of with the, the, ba- the Falwell's Baker, you know, kind of thing, but, you know, looking at, um, I think one thing that's important to point out that I didn't really like about the film and, and um, both of, I think both of the Baker kids said this was that, and I've seen this in other films when secular people try to portray folk, religious folk, especially Pentecostal folks, they don't understand it. So it's like over the top. It is. Yeah. Like, and the one scene there outside the motel, we just seem to get on our knees and pray and, and this whole right. like, like, no. And, you know, and Jay and Tammy, so were like, our parents didn't talk like that at home. <laughs> um, and so it, there's this, like, especially that was one thing that I noticed even on the set is Andrew Garfield portraying Jim Baker. It was, you know, I don't feel like Jim Baker was as over the top as he was portrayed to be in the film. There was definitely a, they were over dramatic, dra- dramatizing, I guess, his yeah. like, that sort of Christian preacher thing that just makes right. it a little slimy. Um, but I think, you know, you were talking about the, the review that was sort of negative, but there was, um, I watched yesterday a, when the trailer came out, a lot of folks did reviews of just the trailer. And there was one person who watched, I can't remember who, and they were like, I hope this film doesn't redeem them because they were crooks. That was sort of their, their takeaway. And it was really yeah. like, I think, I think whatever you, I don't know that this film would necessarily sway anybody to change their opinions that they already had. Um, I think, you know, because everyone needs a villain, especially if you're, if you've been hurt or marginalized by the church and you can say, you know, well, look at those people, you know, mm-hmm. what, you know, they did all these horrible things, but they forget like the greater list of good things that they did in yeah. a lot of ways. And so, um, but yeah, that, um, Oh, you know, I, I just think it, it's helpful. It's like you want to say to people who make films like this, like, do you need a consultant? Because we can, you know, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like the, um, you know, I, I can, I don't know this for a fact, but I think I can state factually, like, in the, the portrayal of the Assemblies of God church service at the film when she's a child. Like, I, I was just thinking of that scene. Right. Yeah. By, by this point, which I don't know, this would probably have been in the 40s or 50s. Like, by that point, Pentecostal, especially classic Pentecostalism was moving out of a fringe movement to really solidifying itself and being respectable church mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And so kind of portraying Pentecostalism as sort of this, you know, backwoods sect of wild people doing things. I think that's the thing about the Assemblies of God is it is a lot more historically structured. There is a liturgy to their worship. And I think that really was you know, that's something that was sort of missing from, from that. And I think, and then when you juxtapose that against him, you know, learning to preach in seminary, which he was an awful preacher, it appears, at least they portrayed it. I saw it that way. I'm like, Ooh, he was really bad. That's why he had to do the talk show format. Um, maybe. And it was better for him. Um, but you see that, like, you know, you see that academic side of Pentecostalism that people don't realize exists. Like there are like, scholars and academics and like there's you know like he was really cutting him down in that scene and rightly so in some ways like trying to you know help him to be accountable to what he's saying Mm -hmm. yeah so we all went to bible college and that was one thing i did pick up on the film and um is when they came home from bible college and they were like super excited about jesus and and all of this that was like the first culture shock of her going to, of, of her going away to college and coming back. And I don't know if you guys experienced this. I still kind of experience it in my family. Um, there's a little bit of suspicion around going to the Bible college and getting <laughs> educated, you know, which in this case, I mean, at least the way the movie portrayed it, the mother wanted her to actually finish her education. Right. Um, but, you know, she had found this. Uh-oh. 
what? Am I here? Yeah, you had blinked out for a second. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, Derek froze a minute ago on my end too, so I don't know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, just one little pin to put there is that I don't, I, I, I thought that at least one of them graduated, unless she was behind him and he finished and she just left with him. Like that's that's, that's something I would want to fact check. Right. Yeah, because in the movie it made it look like they dropped out because they got married. Um, right. Because. I know of people who went to North Central and there are or were like things on campus named after them or okay. given money for. So well, he, I'm sure he at least got an honorary doctorate out of it. It wouldn't be Pentecostalism unless they were handing out honorary doctorates, right? Right. When you have a TV show, you automatically get an honorary doctorate. So um, I have a, uh, I probably shouldn't say this. Maybe I'll edit it out. I have a document that I've kept over the years of all the, leaders in the church of God who have claimed false degrees on their websites. Oh, um, so I'm always saying, I'm always saying maybe I'll publish it. And I'm like, nah, there's one out there. I saw recently. I just, I, whatever. So, yeah. oh yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. So I, I do think that the caricature, but there is a metaphor and I think we're, we want to talk about it. Um, you know, the name of the show, the name of the movie and documentary is the eyes of Tammy Faye. And in the, uh, in the opening scenes of the documentary and of the movie, they, they make a big deal about her eyes and her uh, eyeliner and you know, eyelashes and all that. And in the uh, documentary, um, she talks about how important eyes are. She said, you know, she really strongly believes eyes are the window to the soul. And, um, and, and so like Cami Faye is known for wearing all the makeup. Okay, she's known within Pentecostal circles because even in the even in the eighties and nineties, like in the Church of God, especially that was still very taboo. Uh, I mean, I I heard her referred to Jezebel at my church, you know, growing up. Um, and we had two kinds of people in my church: we had Jim Baker people and Jimmy Swagger people. <laughs> yeah, they left yeah. him out of the and, story. He was a pretty big. Not, he was, not yeah. Player. Yeah, I was, I was shocked that he didn't get any some sort of honorable mention. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, he's that's still wild. alive, so. <laughs> <laughs> True, they probably had to get permission or something and just didn't want to deal with it. Um, so, but at any rate, yeah. So are they, Are what's going on there? Are they, are they shysters? Are they crooks? Are they, are they fooling us? Are they tricksters? What is the, what, what is the mask they're wearing? Um and, 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 you know, what, what do we, what do we want to say about that? So, uh, Jimmy, I don't know, you brought up the mask theme first. So well, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was kind of interesting to see the evolution of, of Tammy Faye from somebody who mm -hmm. wore, you know, what would be considered probably just average amount of makeup by today's standards for women when she was at Bible college. Um, but would have been very risque back then, um, to, you know, being this individual who frankly, by the time they get to the end of the movie almost makes or have the appearance of being a drag queen, like with the level of makeup uh, that she was on. And, you know, even Jim Baker at one point, kind of like behind her back, refers to her as looking like a clown with as much makeup as she has on. And it was interesting. She started off from just, you know, a, a modest amount of makeup to getting this, this point where she's talking about how she's had the whatever put around her lips so that it's permanent. So that you, she, I guess, I'm not an expert in women's makeup, but I guess whatever surgery or tattoo that they do to women to permanently enhance their lips, she had gotten that. And then she had permanently got eyeliner added to her eyelashes and um, our eyelids. And so it's, it was interesting that the, the mask that she started off with, just the light little makeup that was supposed to give her a little more colorful personality, she ended up becomes permanently etched with this mask and mm -hmm. the difference between her and the mask is it and you know something you can't make a division before anymore she used to just be able to wipe it off when she go to bed at night or take a shower um as something she could still do something about but uh, they they show very powerfully in the movie that they're trying to get the makeup off her face so that they can prep her for whatever photo shoot she's getting ready to do and they realize they can't get it off and she has to explain to them that it's oh it's you know tattooed onto me and they're and I just find that interesting that the, the mask, I, I don't know. I just kind of saw it preaching to me a little bit, preaching mm -hmm. to the church that we all kind of have these masks and it's amazing. The little mask that we so innocently start wearing, um, you know, well, good intention as it may be eventually become indistinguishable from who we are as people. 
Um, right. And that's exactly what happened with Tammy Faye. She she had this little mask, and um, you know, by the time we get to the end of the story, even after her life falls to pieces, she's still carrying that mask with, around her with wherever she goes, and it's just become a part of her identity. And I think, man, what a scary place to be as an individual that we start you know, peddling in a little bit of lies or a little exaggeration or something that we see as part of who we are as people, but we start putting on the show, but eventually we can't turn the show off. Um, and I think that's exactly what happened with the Bakers, that, that even through their ups and downs, through um, their successes, through their uh, philandering, through their fraud, through their bilking everybody for dollars and through, you know, their exorbitant exorbitant living that they just couldn't stop. Um, and, but they were still true to who they were on many levels, but it just, it, it, they couldn't let go. And it just became such a part of who they were. And even in their downfall and look at it today, Jim Baker is now on TV as a televangelist peddling apocalypse corn barrels or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, like selling it so he can raise money. And, and Tammy Faye up until, uh, I'd like to say maybe Tammy Faye had a little bit more of a redeemable end to her life um, and when she died back in 2000, early 2000s. But um, it's still, even to the end, she was still Tammy Faye. And it just, you know, it's something she couldn't get rid of. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, so I want to say something. I know uh, Derek has some uh, interesting takes on this, uh, some thoughts about their intentions and, and who they were and what they were, what they might have been about. But yeah, I don't. I, I want to stay away from saying whether it was right or whether it was wrong. But as a minister, I know how hard it is, right, to to keep your own identity sort of separate from the role that you play because it is such a um, it's such an interesting role, you know. And of course, when you're younger, it's you know you you really don't have any sense of yourself as much as you you know you do as you get older. So it's a whole lot easier to sort of play that part um, and, 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 and not sort of feeling any, um, any disconnection or, or, or being at odds with it. But the scene where he's at the table and at the desk and he's getting these phone calls and he's just overwhelmed, right? And he leans back in his chair and he says, Tammy Faye, sometimes I think what God has called me for or called me to do is more than I can bear, right? And, um, and, and I think that's true. I think that's true because like a lot of mega church and mega ministry pastors, you know, they kind of get into this thing. They can't escape. They, 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 they can't not be that. And, uh, and it's a soul sucker. It's a soul sucker, really. Uh, I mean, there are church of God ministers and other ministers who you know, are able to sort of play that part and keep kayfabe and, and all of that. Um, but for most of us, I think it, it's a little harder to do. So I don't know. Like I had a hard time. I had a hard time with it. And, and even with like her makeup, you know, when she goes on Roseanne, Roseanne, there's this interview with her and Roseanne and you know, Roseanne's kind of cruel to her. Roseanne's very in her face, gaslighting her even like I was watching the interview. And I was like, today we would call that gaslighting, right? Like we would call that out immediately because she literally tells Tammy Faye what she thinks about herself is wrong. Well, you shouldn't think that about yourself. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. It's really hard for me to decide because growing up, they were the villains. Um, but I don't know. After watching the movie, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when things changed for them. I don't know if they started out on the right foot and it led to something else. I don't know. I don't know. I think that um, I mean, this is probably a horrible comparison, but I kind of take Tammy Faye's journey as far as like her the persona, sort of like Dolly Parton. Mm. Like people are going to say this and that, so I'm just going to own it, live into it, whatever my interpretation of beauty is for myself you know you know I you know I don't I'm not a woman I don't know especially someone like Tammy Faye who grew up in an environment where you know you couldn't where it was wrong to wear makeup and to look attractive and so to have that door opened you know it's like I had um, some friends in Bible college undergrad who had been Amish and then they like yanked out of the Amish church and became assemblies of God and they were like you should see us when we got to wear makeup it was a wild experience <laughs> that we were a mess. I bet. Um, so, and, and it, you know, also it's like makeup, I'm sure like became when, you know, they live their lives on TV, 
like there's all this PTL was filmed in their house. They didn't own their house. It was owned by the ministry. You know, it's a pars- parsonage, I guess, in the loosest sense of the term. <laughs> you know, so, you know, their kids say basically we were born on the stage, you know, whether we wanted to be or not. And so, it, you know, maybe that getting yourself put together for TV, you know, was, you know, I'm sure there's, we could analyze it psychologically and say, yeah. you know, it was a mass from this or that. But I think some of it was just, when you grew up in one place and then all of a sudden you find freedom to be who you really are and she could express that through her what she wore and how she looked and all that you know I think that's um an interesting point to um uh to make and um but I I see I think when I I saw the documentary quite a few years ago and that really I hadn't I mean I knew about them because um, I found one time I found this record. <laughs> okay. All and, right. Um, I was looking and I have two of them here. I think they were my great grandmother's and I guess she sent the money and these records were probably sent. So I remember as a kid, like a teenager, asking my mom, like, who are, who's Jim and Tamari? And my mom told me like, we don't talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't know, you know, and then I saw like she would be in, you know, the news or, you know, pop culture top things and this and that. And so I didn't really know their story until I, the first time I saw the documentary and I was so like moved by her life story and how she just wanted literally like she, you know, we can say, you know, people say that, you know, well, they were hustlers and or, you know, whatever. I think, I think they are people who started out. I think they always had good intentions, but I think they got in over their heads and they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, could you imagine having a Bible college undergrad degree, probably unaccredited at that point in any way, and then being thrust into the spotlight and then thrust into leading a multi-million dollar enterprise? Mm -hmm. Like, and there, you know, so there was that, and there was this obsession of gems with like building and these visions, you know, and that was like, when you look at the other things they had planned for their site over here, it was just sort of amazing. Um, and so I, I don't think it was, I don't, like I said, I don't think they ever had ill intent or intentionally tried to dupe people or to steal money or this and that. Um, you know, we forget that there was a board of directors, you know, Heritage started, you know, they ha- it was a church that they started in Charlotte and it grew into a ministry and it had all these things going. Um, and, you know, I don't know how, what the dynamics were that were part of that, because there were a lot of other people who tell their stories about being part of the staff or the experience there. And, you know, they're, you know, they thought everything was fine and they, you know, but I think it was them and the people they surrounded themselves with made a lot of bad decisions. I thought, um, you know, in the film toward the end, after all of it sort of completely falls apart with Jerry Falwell and Jim sits back and says, you know, I've been had, I think, um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I think he was had, you know, fall well, obviously, but um, through the whole thing, um, I think there was just a lot of, a lot of mismanagement, but I don't know that any of it was malicious or, you know, poor, you know, malintent, I intended. Because, you know, they always, you know, God bless them for putting on the faces they did when they, didn't make public appearances. I really appreciate the scene in the film when they um, they were doing the interview with, I don't know, 60 Minutes or something. And that yeah, interview is like out there on YouTube. And they they showed, and we only see the interview, but in the film, they kind of end the interview and they show them. And, you know, they literally break down. And I thought that was a really humanizing moment to show, like, um, Daniel, you were saying, like, people don't realize when you're in ministry, like there is this persona that you're expected to keep up and to portray. They wanted their ministry to continue beyond themselves even. That's why they entrusted it to someone they thought they could trust. Yeah. You know, and that's what they really cared about was those people. Cause I think they genuinely cared about people, especially, you know, that comes across with Tammy Faye. I think and so. then, yeah. you know, to, to have all that, you know, fall apart because of their sins being, you know, revealed i think i think the bigger things that the church at large and that fall well and others and their his board who left had problems with are not the financial things i think it was the accusations about his bisexuality homosexuality and his like 
affair or tryst, whatever we want to call it. I think it was the infidelities. Yes. Because in the AG, and I think it probably in the search of God, like those are like the biggest unpardonable sins. They'll tolerate mm-hmm. financial mismanagement for a while. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Cause you know, when I was a kid, that was always the way I understood it. So um, right. for, for whatever reason, I understood that Jim, Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger both messed up at the same time. And that was a big deal. Cause in our churches, they were a big deal at that time. Mm-hmm. My parents watched both of those shows, mostly Jimmy Swagger, but sometimes PTO. We had the and, VHS tapes at my parents of Jimmy Swagger. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I was always told that Jim Baker had fallen because he mismanaged, mismanaged money and Jimmy Swagger, had failed because he had sex with a prostitute i actually did not realize until i watched the movie and i'm just clueless like that 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 there was uh, sexual infidelity in in that whole scandal i knew there was something but i always felt like it was a minor thing and i think i think it did become that i think you know it um it really was a lot about a lot about the money but you know it's interesting so two things that stood out to me that tammy Faye said in the film uh, when she met Jim at Bible college, and of course, we don't know how true this is, but we are talking about the film. Um, when they're sitting on the lawn, uh, he, she describes herself. She says, I'm a very practical person. I'm a practical person. And then when he buys the car, uh, which is foreshadowing, by the way, because from that point forward, Jim Baker is in debt the entire movie, I believe. Um, like, you know, it's and it show, and then when they lose the car, it shows that he's really not good at keeping up with debt. <laughs> You know, and but but she's a practical person. And I think some people have a hard time understanding that under or seeing her as a practical person because she did live so extravagantly. She dresses extravagantly. But in her interviews afterwards, one of her big things was she loves to talk about the deals she gets. She loves to thrift shop. She loves to buy costume jewelry. Uh, She loves to go to estate sales. Yeah. So it's. you know, it's, it's a weird thing. You know, she, she does seem to be a practical person, but also, I don't know. Do y'all think she's one of those people that maybe likes things and, or loves things, but like, doesn't let things own her. I mean, I don't know. Or or, or in the film, Jim told her she was a bottomless pit for things. I don't know. (laughs) I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I don't know them, but you know, it's like some of the things I was reading, I sent to y'all earlier from art, you know, she said like, they they didn't ask for all that money. I think it was just not given to them, like salaries and like the, all these things that their board was just like, I mean, they were the money makers because they were the face. Um, I don't know that it's not like they went in and said, you know, I need all this stuff. They were living, you know, they kind of lived in this world between being a minister and being a celebrity. And so they were kind of trying to appeal to what, how do celebrities live? And then how do ministers live? And how do we, you know, still, you know, maintain. But I, I think they're the type of people that even though they live that way, anybody could have came to them with a need and they would have given them the shirts off their back to help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I don't think they were, they weren't, they weren't in it to profiteer themselves as much as they were to build this sort of Christian world. Yeah. Right. It seemed like they were just enjoying the fruit of their labor. It wasn't like, they weren't going for the money itself. I mean, there is some insinuation that I think um, at one point where they uh, they first came to um, oh, what's his name's uh, Pat Robertson, Pat, Pat Robertson yeah. and they were like very moved and blown away by the pool and the house wow. and his wife's furs, and they're just like, you know, why can't we have some of this? And there's definitely an insinuation maybe that they they definitely had a lust for stuff. But I think, you know, that wasn't their primary motivation. They just looked at it as, hey, there's a better life out there that we could be having. And God wants us to have our best life. Uh, so, like, why are we being robbed? Or, you know, there's more opportunity out for us. So we need to pursue that opportunity, not to, to get the thing itself. They just wanted what was best for them. And I guess that kind of plays into the pragmatics of, well, they just want the best for them. So if that means having to have a global international ministry that's broadcasting 20 million people by satellite um, and, you know, being able to live on a lake house at the same time, well, so be it. Um, they just wanted what was best for them. And it was just, it was almost like the logical extension of, of where they saw their faith taking them. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing I thought, um, and they didn't, it's, I don't know if this was as clear in the film as it should have been, was 
like Jim and Tammy, and I think in the documentary, this is a lot more clear. Like they, they went to CBN and they basically catapulted CBN and made Pat Robertson all that money. And that's sort of what I think Jim is dealing with in that moment. He's like, we've done all this to get him where he is and we're not being, I'm not being recognized or compensated in the same way. You know, right. and then they didn't even go into the film about their, you know, they helped start TVN. Well, then they yes. had a fallout. So they had all to that stuff. There. I never knew that. I was like, wow. Yeah. 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 And so they were like the pioneers of Christian television in a lot of ways. You know, the whole satellite network, they were one of like few yeah. entities anywhere to have a satellite network. So, you know, yeah. Jerry Falwell had a satellite lust or something. Right. He took over. Yeah. So, so they were so like just, smart with people and how to message and let them know if they were, you know, it's like um, there was some article I read that said they were like the Kardashians of, of their time. Really. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So the amusement park, I didn't know this little, little asterisk here, footnote, the amusement park, the Heritage USA that they built, when it was functioning that year, it was the third most attended amusement park under Disney World and Disneyland in the wow. United States of America. Yeah. So it was no joke when it was going on down there. And yeah. uh, I was thinking, I bet Carowinds was glad that, that it fell because. <laughs> well, as, as far as how I understand it from what I've read, and I know some people who went there, you know, growing up and stuff is that it was, and, and if you watch old PTL sort of a few episodes that are out there, they talk about how, you know, they built that, you know, they were on park road here first and they outgrew that. And so they bought, I think it was 5,000 acres, which I live right on the state line and their property. I, if I go to the top of the hill, I can see the still unfinished mm-hmm. tower. Um, but it was, you know, basically it was a ministry center. They built it for their supporters to come to like conferences and concerts. And, you know, if you were all the who's who in Christian entertainment or music, like you came there and performed and were tell it like it was a whole, it was a whole world, you know, it was, you know, and it was, it was the flagship, ministry pretty much of the assemblies of god and pentecostalism i think overall yeah. and so were they, they, were they still assemblies of god like do you know he wasn't he wasn't defrocked until all the scandal stuff came out okay Delhi. yeah i was wondering so, that. i didn't know yeah and i think you know and she was ordained too which i'm okay. sure with the same because a lot of other denominations wouldn't ordain women then um so they built their ministry center and it was all about, and they're like, oh, well, we need something for kids and youth and things like that. So they built this amusement park so that while the parents are like in a marriage um, conference, their kids can yeah. go play. So they really, I, Heritage USA to me, it's like church camp on steroids. Yeah. It never yeah. ends. Or camp, is, meeting. Church everything, camp meeting. Yeah. Everything they did was something on steroids. It felt like, you know, uh-huh. it was like, so, all right. So I want to, I do want to, I want to, hammer home on this a little more because it's, it's an important topic in the church. It's an important topic yeah, for me as a minister. I, I can speak to it too. So I, I think in general, we can agree. They weren't like Robert Tilton, right? Like they weren't all out charlatans uh, in it just for the money, faking the act a hundred percent, you know, all about that. It definitely that prosperity message did sort of come into his preaching, especially later when he really got in debt, he played that card heavy. Um, if you go back and watch clips of, of him doing that and raising money, he really pushes the envelope you know, on that. You want to be sick, you want to be healthy, so into the kingdom of God kind of stuff. But it is a question, I think, in every church in America right now, uh, how much is too much? You know, uh, even with Stephen Furtick, all right? right, Stephen Furtick here in Charlotte, another one who's come under fire for his use of money. Um, he did do something different, though. He did take his own royalties from his books the bakers did not. They all the royalties from their books and music went to the ministry, and they were paid out of it. Um, which uh, in the documentary, Tammy Faye said she regretted that she wished they would have just taken their money, and then nobody could have said anything about the way they wanted to live, and it would have been more than what they were getting paid. She claims. Um, so, so how much is too much? Because I was thinking about this. Okay, my wife and I had this conversation. She went and watched the movie with me uh, the last time I went. And we had this conversation. Because uh, at one of our churches, she actually for a while did the finances because it was a, a replant and there was really no one that could do it. And we were trying to get it going. And so she oversaw that. Uh, you know, of course, we had all the accountability in place. But it was, she, you know, she said she always felt bad writing the checks uh, to us because she saw what was coming in. You know, and we were getting way underpaid. I still had to work a part time job. And as a minister, I always felt like 
I, I was ambivalent about what I was getting paid. On the one hand, uh, you know, most people would feel like it probably wasn't enough for what I was doing. Um, I never felt that way, but I'm really hard on, on myself and, and what I do. I always was happy to get what I got. But, um, but it is one of those things that's hard to put a value on. It's really right. hard to put a value on the worth of a minister. You know, most jobs you, you have some metric to work with, but it's kind of dangerous to work with too many metrics in ministry because there's so many things you can't measure, you know, like the growth of the people you lead, um, the way their lives are transformed, the, the relationships you build, the, the crises you see people through. Um, and I don't think like a, just pe people that aren't in the church, they don't understand that. You know, it's, um, it is a very challenging job. Most pastors work harder than they realize that they work. Um, they deal with more than they're willing to talk about. And, um, and they aren't very well taken care of largely, you know. So I don't know. How much is too much? You know, I don't know. I think those are good questions. Um, you know, I, I, I once knew a church, and I forget where it was, but that said that in their denomination, they look to pay their minister the equivalent of what an adjunct professor at the local private college would make. And I was okay. like, like that, that, they kind of wanted to set some sort of like, that was the baseline average salary for ministers within their denomination. But then I know the other extreme that, you know, well, don't you want your man of God blessed? And like, don't you want to bless the man of God? And, and, and like, you know, the pastor lives like royalty. Um, and like, like there is no break whatsoever when it comes to the idea of how much you should pay your local minister. But I think a lot of those conversations around money and stuff really stems from a problem. I think that is probably distinct to America. And it's this sense of we don't really like, especially as Christians, have a sense of, you know, that maybe we just need to be careful with all this prosperity that we have um, and that there needs to be a sense of modesty that's not tied to makeup, but is tied to the degree of we, what kind of lives we live, that we shouldn't be a people who have the latest and greatest, biggest and baddest everything. And that looks like somebody who's just living the American dream and sparkles and has all the latest designer jeans and brand names, everything. Like we, we almost get this impression that we, uh, you know, that we're looking to, keep up with the Joneses. And even if we're buying into the Dave Ramsey thing, if you don't want to be like the Joneses because they're broke, you know, that promotes a frugal lifestyle, that frugality is only a temporary journey onto your destination to building wealth. Um, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, be frugal so that you can build wealth. Right. And, and so, and while I think there's, you know, some good things in that, but I think we, we haven't gotten the impression from the scriptures and our readings of scriptures that, you know, when, especially when, what is it, in Peter, when he talks about not adorning yourselves with silver and gold and braided hair and all that sort of stuff, um, that a lot of people look at that, oh, look, women shouldn't wear makeup. But in reality, he was talking about the glitzy, the glamour, um, the, the things that people use to demonstrate their wealth status and to show that they have a place in society and that they're connected to power. Um, and really, that's so much what our wealth tries to communicate. And I think you know, for the ministers who want to like live that exorbitant lifestyle, like the Stephen Furtick's of the world or the Jim and Tammy's of the world, you know, they want to project their success because that's a show of God's favor and blessing. And if they project success, then they will also attract people who want to be successful like they are. Um, and they'll start finding themselves in circles that are surrounded by nothing but successful people and not the poor, not the marginalized, not the least of these. Yeah. Um, because who wants to be amongst the least of these when there's a great, you know, opportunity to be around the, the power brokers, the, the Jerry Falwells of the world, the, the individuals who like it portrays in the movie that are able to have the president's ear, you know, they were like, I have something to go to Reagan. Um, and, and, you know, the entire Christian, Christian coalition thing, um, that, that was very much an extension of that. And even though I don't think Jerry Falwell ever got caught up so much in the exorbitant lifestyle that Jim and Tammy did, he, he went for another direction. Um, he, I almost thought the movie kind of portrayed him as a Dick Cheney type individual. Um, and, and that's the kind of attitude and mindset that he was. He was the power broker. He was the guy behind the scenes making the things work. 
and look at how he was going to influence Reagan. And look, even Reagan uh, paid lip service to Jim and Tammy at one point. And that was all because of, um, you know, Jerry Falwell. Um, and so I think, you know, you have those two sides of, of the money, the wealth, the success, as well as the reach for power. Um, and something about us as American Christians, we just can't separate ourselves from that pursuit. And we almost feel like we are um, somehow doing a disservice to Jesus not to pursue both. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at least in the, in the, in regards to Tammy Faye, um, she saw a problem with that. I, I, so I think Jerry Falwell was frustrated because he never could get them on board with the whole vision of being a power broker in politics. Right. You know, and uh, I don't know how much Jim was into it and Tammy Faye was resistant, but I know not just based on the film, but the documentary and interviews with her, she was very much against that from, from the get go. She, she, she had red flags everywhere with Jerry Falwell. Um, she, and she begged Jim not to give him a power on the board and not to step away and give his seat to him. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, that's a great point. It's not just the money, but it's the way that, you know, um, it's what we do with the money, you know. And even though they lived extravagant, they, they were resistant to the powers, if you will, like that. that and they want to leave a, leave a legacy, but I don't think they really saw that in, in terms of like having political power or, or social power even. You know? I think they showed off their wealth, but, right. you know. I think they had a healthy understanding of a separation of church and state generally i mean there our are some our fellow baptist chimes in with separation <laughs> of church and state it's yeah. only right <laughs> um i think to go back to sort of your um <clears throat> when we talk about money overall i think we have to look at it historically also is that it's kind of talked about earlier where pentecostal folks for a long time were really seen as sort of the backwoods woo woo like you know you're sort of over there and so, um, you know, this was this whole, that whole sort of those eras, those decades, it's sort of its, its establishment in mainline, acceptable, polite society. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so it wasn't so much about the money per se, but it was about being successful, being educated, being present at, you know, it, in positions of, of power and of leadership and of influence. That's true. Um, not not with a political agenda. I don't think, you know, the Bakers, I think the AG until the last 10 to 15 years was really apolitical in many ways. You know, it has a history of being, um, before World War I, they were um, pacifists. Pacifists, yeah. Yeah. So, um, God too. yeah. So, I, but I think, you know, in the, in the AG, and especially in classic Pentecostalism or these other, other sort of what I would kind of classify as like non-mainline traditions, there, there was sort of this expectation that the, the, the socioeconomic position of a minister of a congregation should be an example of what a congregant wants to attain or work toward. Yeah, they almost lived vicariously, the congregation almost lives vicariously through the leader, yes. which is why yes. they're completely fine with him driving a nicer car, having a nicer house. Right. It's, yes. it's a, if we can support our minister to live this life, then we are, there's pride in that. Yes. You know, yes, we're, you know, we're going to gift our minister a BMW Mercedes Benz with a special parking place, you know, and it gives them pride. Um, so I think, you know, and also when you have, um, that's one thing I, I've kind of, I've talked with a coworker who grew up in Baptist churches, but more Pentecostal ish style understandings of the spirit and, you know, where, and I think, and I, you know, how, Folks in mainline churches typically, you know, the education level, the socioeconomic level is a lot different. In the assemblies of a lot of the Pentecostal charismatic circles, you have a lot of folks who their, their interpretation and their understanding of life and faith is different because it's a necessity to survive. Right. They don't have their other tangible um, material resources and uh, to rely on to be successful in this life. Um, and so that, that's something that I've, I think sort of informs this a little bit overall in the big picture of Christendom in America. Yeah. Um, it's, it, so it sort of goes into that, you know, the bakers, you know, they're successful. If I sow into their ministry or if I sow into my local church, you know, I'm being part of this bigger vision that's 
bigger and beyond me, you know, to, to save the world, you know, or, you know, to, to change the world, to, you know, bring, you know, heaven to earth, um, which are good things in essence and, you know, sort of foundational to the faith, but it, you do kind of get caught up in, you know, where does it end? What is it, you know, do you, it was um, sort of like, I had a, a friend in Bible college who he said, you know, he was going to be a minister and he told his dad, he's like, you know, I never want to take a big salary, this and that. And his dad said, well, you should try, you should live at least at the level, the average level of the people that you're ministering to, or you won't really have any clout with them. Mm. Um, and I always thought that was a really wise um, sort of perspective on that. Yeah. Um, so, it, so yeah, I think, I think it, it's a, it's a struggle all around when it comes to what's too much, how much is too much, who decides what's too much or not too much, you know? Right. You know, you're in, you're in a situation where it's like a church might say, you know, we want to give you all this and this and this. So it's like, well, do you accept that or do you not? Or, right. but yeah, you know. it's a challenge. And it's, it's not only that dynamic, there's also the dynamic of, um, of the power that that has over you as a minister. So for instance, <clears throat> all right. In, in my notes, when I when I was thinking about the way the characters are portrayed, and I, I I told Jimmy this right after the movie the first time we watched it, Jim Baker just comes across as a little bitch like the whole movie <laughs> because he continually is telling people he's sorry, crying, and he always you know, I feel like he leaves as ambitious as he is, he leaves a lot of the power in his life in the hands of other people, right? He's always dependent somehow, even on Tammy Faye, right? I mean, they, they started off with her puppets. That's that's the show that started getting them airtime was the puppet show um, before he was preaching and stuff. He, mm -hmm. She was the main act. And so uh, Will Willimon once said that uh, preaching is one of the weirdest vocations in the world. Pastoring is one of the strangest vocations in the world because every week you get up and tell the people who pay you things that they don't want to hear. And it's like, there is this weird dynamic of, you know, you being, uh, being paid by these people and being held accountable uh, to them to some degree. So as much as you, as much as you want to say, right, that, uh, that it has no effect and, and you're disconnected from it, you always want to make the best decision, always want to make the most ethical decision as a leader in church. Uh, this is always something that comes up. You guys know you've been on church staffs before you sit in on those meetings uh there's you know, certain things will come up. You can't do that. It might it might bother such and such, or this donor does this, and we have to be careful how we say this. Like it's just inevitable, right? And you know, maybe they're, you know, and not just them. I think there's been lots of ministers who are examples of of how that can go wrong. You know. Um, all right, what do you guys want to talk about next? Uh, I do want to talk about um, we've beat around the bush on Falwell. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we should talk about him a little bit because I don't know, you know, people who are listening to this, everyone may not realize um, everything that was going on at that time. So uh, there was this thing known as the Falwell takeover. Is that the correct term, Derek? Yeah, I, I would call it that. I think. Um, I mean, I've heard it called that by lots of bad. Right. I, I never heard of this until I went to Gardner Webb and then I heard about it. So, yeah. One thing that I'm not sure about talking about the film is I don't know that the that they that the bakers and jerry falwell had a relationship like they portray the film for as long as they did okay because um you know falwell was sort of of the ilk that pentecostal is like he's i'm i'm would be very sure that he would be a cessationist mm -hmm. um you know that those get like that's all just nonsense and it's you know it's you know because he i mean i mean I think I, I kind of sent you a message earlier that said that, you know, when you look at Jerry Falwell, you have to actually go back to like the 1920s to a man named J. Frank Norris. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, have any of you heard of him? I looked him up because you mentioned him. So I'm, I'm Wikipedia, so, I'm Wikipedia literate. Yeah. Wow. So J. Frank Norris was a, was the minister at the First Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas in the 19, early 1900s to the 1920s. He started the first like radio broadcast. He was the first, like one of the first radio preachers. He, he had a church in Fort Worth. He started, he also went and pastored a church in Detroit. He would fly back and forth, like in the twenties, shot a man in his office and was acquitted. Wow. The church oh, yeah. was seriously burned down. 
Yeah. Um, but he was so fundamental that the Southern Baptist Convention almost kicked him out. That's, That's how the Southern Baptist Church has changed. So yeah. he started a Bible college at some point in Fort Worth. Jerry Falwell was a student of, his, of that school. Okay. So Jerry Falwell was educated by this extremely fundamentalist person. Mm -hmm. um, the Assemblies of God are not fun. Historically, traditionally, we're not fundamentalist. Right. Um, they've swayed the other way since I would say the 80s or the 90s, actually. Um, so they are, and, and Tammy Faye points this out at one point where she says something, she's just charismatic, which I was had a problem with because no, they're Pentecostal. That's what they would, they wouldn't have said charismatic. Right. <laughs> but those two, like, a, you know, a fundamentalist Southern Baptist and an Assemblies of God person theologically at that point were in different worlds altogether in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there would not have been a, they could not have necessarily done ministry together in many ways. And so um, my personal interpretation of the whole thing from little things I've read and just kind of knowing a bit about both traditions is that Falwell just saw them as a means to an end. They, he had an agenda politically and socially and the fall or, and the bakers had the audience that he needed to pull into his agenda. And so, you know, Baptists are really good at scheming. A group of six or eight men took over the Southern Baptist convention. They're in it for the long haul. And other groups have taken the lead on that since then on schisms and, and, and denominational split. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because Falwell led that within the Southern Baptist Convention right around the same time. <clears throat> and, well, yeah, he was he was sort of part of it. Yeah. Yeah, because he eventually ri rises to be the head of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, I don't know if he was ever president. There was some other men who were. OK, because he was so, sort of Southern Baptist, but not he wasn't into it like Paige Patterson or some of the others. I forget their names who. Right. Who were literally like having meetings. You know, they met at the Cafe du Monde in Louisiana to. To, to plan the takeover or yeah. I think that's where it was or something there's some story um but yes you know so you had this um sort of in the late 80s early 90s that's when the Southern Baptist Convention when you had depending on which side you're on the fundamentalist takeover or the conservative resurgence right um and so you know and I think the bakers like you said like they were sort of apolitical the assemblies of God has sort of always March to the beat of its own drum over here on the side of all these other denominational things. And they were in a good place and all that. And then I think, I think it was the Falwell saw them as, as a, as an access point to a lot of people and a lot yeah. of money. Absolutely. Yeah. He yeah. was impressed by their satellites. He was. Yeah. <laughs> he wanted their infrastructure. He was. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and especially I'm sure that, you know, he, he was a segregationist also. So, you know, very, very, you know, preached against segregation. You know, that's why he started Liberty University. It started as a school at the church for, you know, like a lot of places in the South, when integration happened, they started, that's why a lot of, there's a lot of private schools, especially the deeper South you go and West, you know, um, they started schools for their white kids because they didn't want them to be integrated. He was a big part of that. And so, so you had the Assemblies of God, which has pretty much always been integrated as much as it could be. It still has its issues with racism and things like that. But in the, for the most part, it, it did better right. than the Southern Baptist. Right. So you had the Bakers on TV, you know, you know, it's the 70s now, but still like full integration. You know, you've got this. I'm sure there were a lot of people in that sh in their staff and show that Derek Falwell would not have approved of their lifestyles and lives. And you saw he saw them creeping toward being more liberal than he could stand, right. um, you know, which I think that comes through in the film. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And he had zero tolerance for that um, because like Gardner Webb Divinity School, a lot of the uh, professors there actually lost their job during that takeover. And Falwell, I, maybe he wasn't the president, but he was in some position of power to make that decision. And uh, several of them were from Wake Forest at the time and literally went into work uh, after the weekend and their locks had been changed on their office doors, all their books outside. 
Um, and that's either how the Divinity School at Garden Web was started or, or they, that's, you know, when it really became something because they got a lot of those Wake Forest professors that, yeah. um, that came in. But yeah, he was, uh, he was really a force to be reckoned with. And in the documentary, um, it talks about how, or the narrator, RuPaul narrates, uh, RuPaul says, talks about their naivete. Uh, and, and basically, they had never run up against those kind of, that kind of church people. I have. They're in the church of God. I mean, I've dealt with some state overseers and some district overseers um, who uh, absolutely fit that mold of just completely narcissistic, power hungry, very manipulative. In the um, name of God. Yes. All, yeah, absolutely. And so it's like, um, you know, it's yeah, he, he was really a force to be reckoned with. And they ran into that and those powerful men and. They were, they were a little bit naive, I think, and they didn't realize the cutthroat game that they were playing because those guys, they, they didn't play, and they don't play, you know, in church politics. So, um, uh, let's see here, guys. We've talked about a lot. We've covered almost everything here, I think. Well, let's talk about um, – let's talk about the Steve Peters interview. Um, also, do you guys know, like in the film, the adultery scene, her and the uh, uh, guitar player? I can't think of his name right now. Um, Gary something. I've watched the clip of her on TV. Uh, she never confesses to adultery. Like I don't seen. think. I don't think that. I think there was some. It might have been, you know, I didn't even, I didn't know about any of that until I saw the film. So that was all new, but I'm going to say that a lot of that was, and Jay Baker said that that was not, that wasn't an accurate portrayal, that whole thing. Like there was some, I think there might've been some emotional sure. thing, but I don't know that she had in, uh, infidelity like Jim did. Right, right. Yeah, I felt like that was, whole, that whole thing was more really a fundraising technique because the more she cried, the more the phone drained. You know? <laughs> and um, I kind of felt bad for her. Like I did feel bad for her several times in the movie. I felt like, I felt like she kind of took the brunt of a lot of stuff, you know, for the sake of saving face. That was kind of, kind of the way that the cards fell. Um, okay. I did not know that. Tam and J Jimmy, did you know this, that Tammy Faye was as vocal about LGBTQ stuff at that time? I wasn't really aware of that. I'd kind of heard some things towards like, you know, in retrospect, but no, I, I never heard that. Like, I didn't know actually that their entire show even had risque topics. Like, right. you know, where they showed them how to use a penis. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, um, come again. Uh, no pun intended. There. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it was just kind of like, um, I, I had no idea that they were like that Tammy Faye and them were trying to push real issues on the show. I just thought it was all fun and games. And I, I, I had no idea that they were doing that. But, you know, I guess the movie made it very clear that's actually what happened. And like you said, it fact checked itself by showing clips um, from what they did. And uh, I was uh, pretty shocked at it because I was just like, man, that's. That's definitely something I never heard. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, um, it didn't seem like they got a lot of, at least in my church. I mean, I didn't hear, and that would be something we would hear about if it was a big deal, you know? Right. So, and they were so cutting edge, you know, they were like introducing all kinds of new things like dog shows and cupcakes and, uh, you know, all this cup, cup, cupcake making Christian, and all this on the show. Christian right? Rock. Yeah. Christian Rock. So maybe, maybe people, I almost feel like they, they were kind of leading people in a way that people were following them on this, on this journey, right? Like maybe it didn't like in today's culture, I feel like it'd be like the worst thing ever, you know, if, if someone in certain circles did that, you know, with that kind of influence, but back then maybe people were a little bit more open, you know, to thinking outside the box because, you know, they already were, you know, they were fashioning ministry very differently than it had been done. So. Well, maybe uh, some uh, of it's also that their ministry wasn't like you talk about, as so much rigid fundamentalist um and its mentality and they had such a broad appeal um and yeah they appeal a lot to pentecostal types church of god assembly of god types but they i think they really had a broader appeal of the culture at all together i mean like yeah. growing up when my parents they watched 
um, Swagger and Baker and them. And even though my mom had a Pentecostal background, my dad was raised Catholic and they weren't particularly religious at the time and we weren't going to church at the time. So I think if anything controversial would have been like that on TV, they would have just thought, oh, they're kind of taking an Oprah type thing here on, on right. their show. And they didn't look at it as, I mean, because it had such a variety show like feel to the show that maybe they could have a broader discussion and people not be outraged, not only because their audience wasn't hardcore fundamentalist. It was, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I guess you would say like the average attendee at Elevation Church is not a Southern Baptist, even though Elevation Church is a Southern Baptist church, right. you know, you, that you would not find hard, strong Southern Baptist dogma, fundamentalist type dogma floating around in Elevation Church today, because frankly, everybody's just there for the season prediction. Um, and I think maybe that's kind of what you would have probably found amongst the audience. And maybe why it wouldn't have been as controversial with their supporters as it would a Jerry Falwell type individual. I don't know. I just my thought I could be wrong on it. Right. No, yeah. As as I think when it comes to like LGBT include like I was watching uh you know, I think that they were on a journey and they were open to learning and growing and understanding at that point in the you know the 80s. And you know, we're you know, I think the big thing on that was having, you know, you kind of have to the AIDS crisis, she was really honing in on the the compassion that the church needed to show for AIDS patients and, right. and, and that whole, you know, really like rec recognizing it and saying, you know, we have a thing to do here. I don't know that they wouldn't at that point have been affirming, like we understand affirming folks to be today within the church. They couldn't sure. be, or they would have had their licenses revoked from the denomination because they're doing that now really quick, especially, but even then, and that's what I think, I think, like I said earlier, like that's what the same as a guy will, will redeem you for certain things, but there are some of those unpardonable doctrines. Like if you're inclusive or even hint at, you know, condoning homosexuality, you're like, you're out. That's it. That's like the unpardonable thing. You, 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 you know, God doesn't change on that. Um, so I think that that interview, it, it, it was good in a lot of ways. And that's what, that's what I think is for me, I see a real loss to the church in America at large because they had such an influence and they were so non-threatening in their, in their outreach and in their conversations and they were really authentic. And I think they were fun. I think, yeah. you know, people, Jerry Falwell is not fun. <laughs> like, he's like, they called him like daddy Falwell or something, but, right, right. and like, they just wanted people to enjoy. And I think that's what, and I, I really feel that their ministry sort of crumbling left a vacuum of optimism. You know, there was a lot of optimism in what they were doing. We're building for the kingdom. We're going to change the world. We're helping people. We're building these homes for, for these marginalized folks that need it. You know, we're having these tough discussions. You know, we're meeting people where they are in everyday conversations of real life. We're not living in this heady theological world of perfection necessarily. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the Southern Baptist, you know, was conservative, the fundamentalist takeover, all, like, there was all these things that were happening in society. And I think that they really left this vacuum that the church has never really recovered from in a lot of ways at large, because no one could fit into that space that they really fit in between these different worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and, you know, and so then the predominant Christian message in America is, you know, becomes Jimmy Swagger, who was a hot mess by that point, and, you know, Pat Robertson, and, you know, you lose the, the most moderate voice that was the largest, really, and I think that, it, you know, like I said, I think it was, it, if their ministry had survived or been redeemed with them in place, I think it, it would have drastically changed the, the, not only the religious culture in America, but also the political culture in a lot of ways, because I did read something once when I did a, um, seminary paper on sort of the, the history of Baptist associations and conventions and Southern Baptists. And, you know, this book kind of said the Southern Baptist convention has such a strong hold in American life that however it tracks the national narrative will sort of follow. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
so that that's sort of my you know I I almost grieve the loss of PTL because I you know I didn't grow up that close to it, right. but I see what it was and what it was doing and its influence it had across denominational lines, and I think that no one else has been able to impact it the same way that they were in really positive ways. Yeah. I agree with that. I actually, one of the questions I had asked myself was, had this, had it not fallen the way that it did, um, would Heritage USA still be as competitive as an amusement park, mm. right? Like, and the ministry in general, would it have survived the culture wars or would the culture wars have looked different because of the influence they might've had on the culture by then, you know? Um, Cause I was just thinking about things that would be, they would have to deal with now because in the in the documentary when it shows the water park like a lot of the men have shirts on and you know the women are covered up and you know all this kind of stuff and i'm like i wonder what it would look like in 2020 you know <laughs> I, I wonder what that would be like and if they would have survived the culture wars i don't know but I, that's that's a good that's a good take Derek, because um i, I, I never thought about it but I, I think you're i think you're onto something yeah when i um like for it, it's kind of uncanny now, you know, in retrospect, I look back at the, the large assemblies of God church that I grew up in mostly. And, you know, they had a new minister came, came there in 1983, which is the year I was born. And we went, we started attending there in 93, 93. So about 10 years up, but, but like their music ministry, their music, their style of worship, that particular senior minister looked and had the persona and manner of Jim Baker. Mm. And so it was like, and you knew a lot of people in that church were influenced by PT, you know, it's the same denomination, all these other things people would, it wasn't that terribly far away to go. And so, and it was the same thing where, and he was like obsessed with building this minister, like they expanded the church, they built all this overseas building. And then he like had infidelity and his wife left. Like there was all this drama that like paralleled, sort of the bakers, but a little bit later, it was kind of wild, but really yeah. interesting. It's kind of like you were saying, like you, you emulate these, these personas and people. And I think we probably saw that in a lot of, especially some of the God churches in that, in, in the nineties. And then you saw where after that sort of generation, sort of finished ministry, where the some of the God took a, has taken in the last 20 years, a really hard right turn theologically and socially. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, guys, do you guys want to just give some final thoughts and call it a night? What's favorite scenes? Favorite scenes. Okay, Ooh. let's do that. Uh, I actually wrote mine down. So, um, so I'll go first. I, favorite scenes for me where it was uh, the table scene where she pulls her chair up to the table. Um, and I found the, it, it was just painful, the, the two scenes as a minister where he was at the desk and she, you know, she asked the question, we're, we're doing the right thing though, or we're doing the right thing, we're doing good things. And he's like, is that a question? Um, you know, that, that was powerful. And then the scene where he, can, where, where he has his confession to her um, and just for sheer drama dramatics, like she pulls that scene off masterfully, just cinematically, it's, she, she does a great job acting. Um, but I just, I loved it because it was the first time I ever felt like they just really opened up to each other about what was wrong. And even though at first they're kind of projecting it onto each other back and forth as they're arguing, you know, it's kind of like pot calling kettle black, so to speak. Um, but at any rate, th those are my favorite scenes. So I would say the table scene um, and. So what about you, Derek? We'll come back to come around this way on my screen. Oh, yeah. Um, so for me, the, the table scene was actually the most meaningful and, and powerful one. I, I wrote about um, Facebook the other day. Um, I um, am sort of co-leading a group of, of folks within the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, which is sort of one of those Baptist groups that I'm part of. And they've been trying to work through um, LGBT inclusion and affirmation more um, uh, intentionally. And so I'm leading a group for that. And, you know, one of the struggles that we always talk about is that within the, I use denomination because that's basically what it is. 
that they aren't intentional about including LGBTQ folks. And so we always talk about in our group that, and I use this analogy, it's like, if they're not gonna make a seat for me at that table where I know I belong, I've just got to drag my own chair and just make, put myself there. Mm -hmm. And so to, you know, when I saw her kind of doing that and the emphasis they put on that and making it this big dramatic moment, I'm like, yes. (laughs) I'm like, that is exactly what marginalized folks in the church have to do and must do you know, be that women in spaces where women aren't allowed to be called and ordained and all that. Thankfully, you know, we've been in tradition where that has been pretty, pretty, pretty decent, you know, but there's, you know, all these other marginalized folks. It's like, you know, when you look across there and you see this place that there's important decisions being made there that I have something to add that's valuable and important and valid. And I belong there. You know, I think she saw herself as belonging there um, in two ways. One, like she saw herself and Jim as like, they were a team. They were doing these things together. They, he couldn't be successful without her. I think they were learning that they needed each other to be successful and to survive. And so she's like, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sit here with these women. I don't fit in with them. Like, I want to be where the decision being made. I want to know what's ha- what my husband's committing us to also. So there's that sort of um, egalitarian sort of thing. Like I'm going to be there with my husband. And um, there's that. And then there's also the like that whole ministry thing. Like, I'm just as called as my husband to this. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's us. And I'm going to, you know, I want to know what's happening. I want to have some control and some autonomy in what, in what we do and what we say. And so, and I think Tammy Faye did that. And, you know, it, you know, I, I think that she established herself as that. I doubt, you know, and, you know, a lot of things like, um, she um, sort of going back to the, the Peters interview, you know, the, the family has said, and people will say that, like, that wasn't just her, that was both of them. And they did run that show as a team. And so, mm-hmm. you know, she made it very clear that she was, you know, through that whole film, like, this is, you know, it's not about just you, Jim, it's me mm-hmm. as well. Right. And, and then after the fact, after, you know, there's interviews and in her own shows later in life where she talks about, you know, I didn't need that man. You know, I was, you know, I was pretty capable, you know, and she really found herself after her divorce from him yeah. and, and, and knew that she did a lot of things that were, that she pushed Jim Baker to be who Jim Baker was. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. For me, the two scenes that stick out to me as I think about it is one near the beginning and one near at the end, the beginning when she's longing to be accepted into the assembly of God church. And her mom tells her, you can't go in there because I'm a divorcee and they're going to look down on you. And, and she doesn't understand why she can't be there. But then she boldly comes down the aisle and gets filled with the spirit and finds acceptance as a person with a, a young person within the church. And then the scene towards the end where she's at this you know apartment complex and her life is clearly falling apart and she's you know hitting the reboot button and she's walking across the parking lot and she can hear some teenage boys snickering about her and, and she hears them and she's like, I'm not just going to walk by and let them make fun of me. And she, instead she crosses the parking lot and goes up and introduces herself and says, hi, I'm Tammy Faye. And she comes over there and shakes those boys hands. And I think those scenes are kind of, you know, the sandwich for which the movie has made is just this longing for uh, Tammy Faye to be accepted for who she is as a person. Um, and to accept her and her humanity, uh, warts and all. Um, and I think that really encapsulated the entire movie for me, those, those two scenes. Yeah. And they said that um, Tammy Sue in her interview, which if you haven't read the two interviews that Tammy Sue and Jay Baker did, like the day after the film they were put out, they were really good for mm-hmm. their initial feedback and just talking about their mom and and she talked about how her and her mom, they would go shopping and stuff and people would be talking about them, making fun of them. And Tammy was always like going up to them and introducing herself, like being the bigger person and just, and not because she had an ax to grind necessarily, because she's like, you know, if you're going to talk about me, you're going to know me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Very good stuff. Yeah. It was all in all, I really enjoyed the movie um, all the way through. I thought it was a great film. Um, and I thought they, I thought they pulled the, the rolls off masterfully. Um, can y'all still hear me? Yeah. Okay. My Bluetooth may die, and if it does, I'm going to switch audio real quick. But uh, so I may let you guys uh, 
uh, talk a bit. Do, do, do we want to just get some final thoughts and call it a night, or do you guys have anything else you want to discuss? I think I'm set. Not too much. Um, okay. What yeah, I, I do. If you didn't listen sorry, to the, the song I sent you, I think, Dan, you said about it, and it's on YouTube. It's like the Ballad of PTL or something. Yeah, that was fantastic. I yeah. can't believe that wasn't in the movie. <laughs> yeah, she did, yeah. Like it was sort of after it fell apart, she like did this whole album, and that was like her thumb and or her finger, yeah. you know, given so, so the name of the song is the, the Ballad of Jim and Tammy. And uh, I'll post a link to it in the in the description to this video on YouTube so that so that it's there. Um, and I'll find those interviews as well of the children. See if I can't post that in the description as well. So I'll make sure we have it. So I thought about playing it and I was like, ah, eh, I don't want to be yanked for copyright. So um so anyway so we'll, we'll just leave it at that uh so yeah final thoughts Derek um yeah I think I think it's um as far as the film I think it's a great film but you know it's you know some of the, the reviews I read people you know think and I do think that that the story is so complex and it's so deep it would be hard to do it the justice it really needs in a, two hours for all the characters and things like that. But I think that the, I, like I said at the beginning, like I so appreciated like Jessica Chastain's intentionality. You know, Jay Baker said that he called, she called him once and Jay's like, I think, you know, you better, you know, my mom better than I do. Um, and it, I think it's, you know, it's, it's so good to see someone outside the church and outside that world recognize, you know, the work that we're all called to do and that, you know, we, we're going to make mistakes and it's going to be messy and ugly and people are never going to understand it. But, you know, if the essence of, if we're really doing what God has called us to do, like Tammy was like, that will, that will survive through. And that will be what people remember. And I think that's what people remember and make fun of her and how big of a personality, but for a lot of folks, what she embodied and what she overcame and what she held true to through the very end is what her legacy is. I just want to know why Kirk Cameron wasn't asked to play Jim Baker. <laughs> the studio, the studio it wasn't a Christian film. Ah, uh, it was the most Christian film I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Kirk Cameron should have totally played Jim Baker. It, it, it was funny on when I was on this. I was like, you know, they're going to probably make this whole film without any profanity. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is, they actually did most of the movie without using much. I think I heard one or two cuss words the entire time. Yeah, which the Bakers would have never, you know, that was a sin. Right. Yeah, well, going through my divorce, I used to not cuss, but lately I've been cussing a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally understand that. Um, very cool. So, yeah, I enjoyed the film. Um, it was good. It definitely has given me a lot to think about. Um, I, I feel I, I agree with you, Derek. I think that, you know, I was surprised at the kind of legacy she had left because it for me had always been overshadowed by the scandal. So getting to know her better uh, was really nice. And um, it, when you were talking about heritage and the impact that it had, I was thinking about how this comes through in the film as well. Um, and especially with the conversation with Steve Peters, it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't expressly doctrinal things that they were addressing. You know, it wasn't necessarily um, theological even, right, um, to some degree. But uh, it connected with people because it was relational. And, uh, and that comes through in the film. Um, and I, I, I had this conversation with a pastor over dinner a few weeks ago, and I'm not a pastor anymore. But one of the questions I think the church has to answer is, how does it, how does it make an impact in a divided world, a world that is so divided, um, when it is one of the most divided institutions in, in society? And largely those divisions are over doctrine more than anything else. And... Um, you know, I told this pastor, I said, I wonder if there's a way for the church to envision uh, um, sort of majors in relationships and sort of takes a looser hand with doctrine. And I know that freaks everybody out, but um, I think it's something that's worth exploring. And um, maybe there's some creative people out there like the Bakers 
um, with some good intentions who can learn from some of the mistakes that have been made in the past and, and maybe do something like that again. Um, it sure wouldn't look like that, but something like that, that kind of brings people together. But uh, yeah, I thought it was a great film. I encourage everyone to watch it. I appreciate you guys jumping on here tonight. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anything? Thanks. Yeah. All right, guys. It's been fun. Yeah, it has been. I've really enjoyed this. Was my audio okay at the end there? I had to switch. 99% of time. Okay. All right. Good deal. <laughs> all right. So hopefully everything recorded good. And um, I'll let you guys know when I get it all put together. But hopefully by Monday. So um, I'll, I'll get it all done. And uh, Jimmy, you did backup audio as well? Yeah, about an hour and 40 minutes here. I'll definitely have to trim it down for my podcast because I usually don't let them run much more than an hour. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you.